Welcome again, everybody. My name is Bill Cavanaugh. For those of you that uh, haven't met me yet, I'm the director of the Center for World Catholicism and Intercultural Theology here at uh, DePaul University. And um, we are a center which is housed in the Catholic Studies Department that um, focuses on research on the Catholic Church in the Global South, so Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Uh, it was founded uh, largely um, under the, the genius of Mike Buddy, professor in the Catholic Studies Department. Um, who, yes, wait, wait. And Mike, astutely recognize that that's where the action is in the Catholic Church these days. And um, in, in Africa, Asia, Latin America, and there's no kind of, and, and the action in a lot of ways is centered around this question of the Holy Spirit. This has been a tremendous uh, explosion in, uh, in, especially in uh, Africa, Asia, and Latin America of the growth of Pentecostal and Charismatic Christianity has grown tenfold since 1970, and now 600 million people call themselves uh, Pentecostals or, or Charismatics. And so um, our annual World Catholicism Week conference is based, is uh, gathered around that set of themes. Last year we did uh, ecology, and in anticipation of the Pope's encyclical, and uh, it was a timely topic, it was an interesting topic, we had a wonderful conference, but the problem was that there wasn't anything to disagree about. There was, but nobody disagreed. Everybody who came and everybody who spoke thought that uh, we need to protect the environment, and that's a good thing. So there was entirely too much agreement, and we just can't have that. So this year, We've chosen a topic uh, on which there's much to disagree and argue about, and I hope that we have gathered a diverse enough range of speakers uh, and a diverse enough audience that we will have some good fights uh, over the next um, uh, few days. Um, some good, uh, good productive intellectual discussions, that is. Uh, and to start us off, uh, I'm very pleased uh, that we have Father Ludovic Lado. Uh, Jesuit priest from uh, Cote d'Ivoire. He's in Abidjan. And there he's the director of the Institute for Human Rights and Dignity. You can read his entire uh, biography in your packet. Uh, I won't go through it all. He joined the Society of Jesus in 1992, originally from Cameroon. Uh, he has a PhD and an MA from Oxford University, and one MA is never enough, so he has another one from the Western, Jesu Western Jesuit School of Theology in Boston, and another one from the Faculté de Philosophie St. Pierre Canisius uh, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Um, and we've invited him especially because of his terrific, very important book called Catholic Pentecostalism and the Paradoxes, of Africanization, which I think has really kind of, in many ways, um, established a new agenda for talking about uh, Catholicism, Pentecostalism, charismatic movements in Africa. So please join me in welcoming Father Ludovic Lord. Good evening to everybody. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Um, and I sincerely thank the organizers of this conference for giving me this opportunity to, to share with you, especially with you interested in the kinds of things I'm interested in. So, uh, uh, so I have the responsibility to introduce the, the fight. <laughs> but in the Holy Spirit we trust. So. <laughs> um, thank you. So, um, the title of my presentation was well, slightly changed, but it is the same content. Uh, um, I put it like Catholic Pentecostalism as 
an ecumenical experiment in Africa. And well, so concerning the topic, uh, I want to look at Catholic Pentecostalism as an ecumenical challenge. And to some extent, as an intercultural experiment, since we are in intercultural theology here, so to honor that aspect of it, and uh, particularly in the context of Africa. And my argument is very straightforward. And I argue that although the acceptance of features of Pentecostalism in the Catholic Church was a major ecumenical breakthrough as from 1967. However, the Catholic Church has managed to domesticate the phenomenon, phenomenon in its own terms, thereby upholding the institutional control of charisma. That's my major argument. And to illustrate that argument, I will use a few examples many empirical data from my anthropological study of Catholic charismatic renewal, mainly in West Africa, from West Africa. Now, um, I start with this quote from this fine book of Vincent. He says, Perhaps the greatest surprise in the whole Pentecostal tradition was the sudden appearance of Catholic Pentecostalism in 1967. And, and I want to look at both these two concepts of greatest surprise and sudden appearance. Well, greatest surprise, yeah, it is true that Catholic Pentecostalism you know, took the Catholic Church by surprise in 1967. Uh, here was a Protestant import breaking into the Catholic Church through the back door. And it was an ecumenical challenge. And finally, the Catholic Church opened the front door. So, from that point of view, yes, it was a great surprise. Now, sudden appearance. Yes, but yes, because nobody saw it coming. But a word of caution from a number of historians and theologians that I'm sure you have read, so we're not going into the details, who say that actually a number of previous development paved the way to Catholic, to Catholic Pentecostalism in the Catholic Church in general, and I would add, maybe in Africa in particular. And I want to consider a few of these previous development, but very quickly. Um, in the Catholic Church in general, you know, the authors have just mentioned they have underlined the fact that all through the 19 and um, maybe beginning of the or the first half of the the 20th century, a number of development actually helped you know, to prepare the Catholic Church for Catholic Pentecostalism. And there you have a, 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 most of them listed. Basically, the rise of devotion to the Holy Spirit, leading Pope Leo XIII to an encyclical on the Holy Spirit, 
and the official institution of the annual novena to the Holy Spirit in 1897. Then the theology of Charism, developed by the, a few German theologians from the, from the 1820s. The liturgical movement, which started in the early 19th century to promote greater participation of the congregation to the liturgy. And the lay movement, which from the beginning of the 20th, which started at the beginning of the 20th century. The biblical movement, which led to the growth of biblical scholarship in the Catholic Church from the mid-1940s onwards. And of course, the Catholic slow openness to the ecumenical movement manifest in the establishment of the Secretary for Christian Unity in the 1960s. The Cusio movement, which originated in Spain in 1949, and of course, Vatican II, Pope John XXIII, Cardinal Sunens, and David Duplexis. All these are mentioned in the literature as a number of previous development which helped the Catholic Church. Maybe, I don't know, providentially <coughs> be prepared for the Pentecostal phenomenon. And if we look at uh, this, at Unitatis Redintegratio, uh, which is the Vatican II decree on ecumenism, there are a few paragraphs there which actually show a great uh, kind of progress in terms of how the Catholic Church looks at non-Catholics. And, uh, and I have that quote hit there, which says, of course, the idea that the separated brethren are acknowledged as brethren is already uh, progress, and not as, no longer as considered as enemies. Um, and it says, uh, number three says, or so paragraph three says, moreover, some and even very many of the significant elements and endowments which together go to build up and give life to the Catholic Church itself can exist outside the visible boundaries of the Catholic Church. That was a kind of revolutionary statement in those days. Um, the written word of God, the life of grace, faith, hope, and charity with the other interior gifts of the Holy Spirit and visible elements too. All of these which came, which come from Christ and lead, lead back to Christ belong by right to the one church of Christ. It's already good that it's not said there to the one Catholic church. Uh, although I'm sure a number of people to this one church of Christ to be the Catholic church and maybe still think that it is the Catholic church. Well, I'm not a theologian, I'm an anthropologist, so don't quote me. Uh, <laughs> and of course, um, an important aspect of uh, this, this development is um, the role that David Duplexis yeah, played um, uh, in, the, in this story. You know, and, and there are a number of writings on this, so I won't go into the details. He was of course, invited to the Second Vatican Council, Council as an observer, uh, representing, of course, classical Pentecostalism. And when we look at the this, you know, decay experience from 1966, we look at the history of this experience of this uh, phenomenon. You, you, we realize that most pioneers of this movement were baptized in the spirit outside the Catholic Church. And again, it has to do with the ecumenical uh, roots or cradle of this phenomenon. And they had to rely on Pentecostal pastors to make sense of their new experiences. 
basically because the Catholic clergy was not prepared pastorally to handle these strange ecstatic experiences exhibited by first Catholic Pentecostals. And although in May 1975 in Rome, Pope Paul VI described the Catholic charismatic renewal as a chance for the spiritual renewal of the church and the world, the Catholic clergy was not prepared to kind of shepherd the, the, the Catholic Pentecostals at this point, at least. And I want to just mention the fact that the change of the name from Catholic Pentecostalism to Catholic Charismatic Renewal, for me, is already a very important indicator at that point that the Catholic Church was ready to welcome features of Pentecostalism but in its own way. Um, so, it, we have to look at this phenomenon, I mean, I propose that we look at this phenomenon, of course, as a post-Vatican II phenomenon, ecumenical experience. And uh, Vincent goes on to say that if the charismatic renewal had begun in the Roman Catholic Church before Vatican II, it would probably have been viewed as a Protestant phenomenon and therefore forbidden to Catholics. And I basically agree with him uh, that, the, that Vatican II, of course, prepared the minds for openness to this kind of experiences, born out, outside the boundaries of the Catholic Church. That was for the Catholic Church in general. Now I want to look at the African context and there are two things I am highlighting here. First one is African pre-colonial beliefs in the invisible world of spirits and related experiences of spirit possession. The second one is African beliefs in witchcraft and related experiences of afflictions. And my argument here, or sub-argument here, is that more than an ecumenical breakthrough, the charismatic predicament has been a framework for an intercultural experiment. Um, first, let us look at the African, well, I bring in here the book of uh, Father Laurenti Magesa on African religion because some of the things I'm going to say are uh, can explain in this book. Uh, uh, and so, when you look at the African pre-missionary beliefs in the invisible world of spirit, it is uh, clear that, I mean, it's a fact that many pre-missionary African religion systems are based on human interaction with the world of spirits. And these are non-human and immaterial agents which have the ability to impact human lives positively or negatively. And some of these spirits are actually at the center of possession calls studied by a number of anthropologists across the continent. And so, African did, Africans did not wait for Pentecostalism to discover a static religion and to learn the language of spirits. African religions had their own share of ecstatic experiences before encountering charismatic Christianity. And from my point of view, this kind of prepared the ground for the kind of, well, I mean, acceptance uh, the charismatic phenomenon had uh, received in the context of Africa. And the second point uh, I touch on here is what I call the resilience of witchcraft beliefs. And again, uh, 
colonization, I mean, colonizers and missionaries believed that education, science, technology, and evangelization will progressively do away with the witchcraft beliefs. And this has not just happened. On the contrary, uh, as sound anthropological studies have shown, witchcraft beliefs have adapted successfully to economic and even what you could call political modernity. And I refer you here to one fine book of Peter Gashir on this topic. And so witchcraft beliefs are still a major source of existential insecurity all over the continent. And a pastoral, a major pastoral challenge for the clergy. And still on this issue of witchcraft beliefs, which for me, according to me, is also an important aspect of the development of the charismatic predicament in the context of Africa. Uh, so, um, as I've just mentioned, it's a major pastoral problem in Catholic parishes in Africa where priests are confronted almost on a daily basis by the laity with witchcraft related issues. And Catholics disappointed by the inability of the clergy to address these issues turn to alternative solutions. And some of these alternative solutions are either traditional religions and diviners, what we call, or the literature has called, African independent churches. And these are basically churches uh, created by Africans in missionary days uh, when the when they, they felt the need to break away from missionary churches and start their own churches. And it goes with a mixture of a number of, uh, I mean, mixture of Christianity with some lo sometime local uh, religion uh, features. Um, and, and some of these actually portray Pentecostal features as Alan Anderson has shown in his work. And another alternative, of course, is Pentecostals and Charismatics. And Catholic Charismatic Renewal, I argue, was probably seen, or is probably seen as an opportunity for a relevant response to witchcraft-related <coughs> issues within the Catholic Church. And uh, concerning the ecumenical and intercultural aspect of it, um, I mentioned that uh, um, in an increasing number of charismatic Catholic priests you know, practice healing ritual in the Catholic Church today. And it is basically an, a, a development from the influence of Pentecostalism. And some have done this in the framework of Catholic charismatic renewal, others individually. And one new thing about this is that contrary to Western missionaries, African priests that we are and lay healers openly believe in the existence of witchcraft and local spirit. And concerning the ecumenical aspect of it, these priests and lay healers are borrowing extensively from the Pentecostal and charismatic religious habitus and idioms to address the healing needs of their parishioners. Um, and I also think it's an intercultural experiment, and I will ex expand on that shortly. Um, they have expanded, you know, Christian, some example, of course, to illustrate this intercultural experiment. 
they have expanded Christian demonology to include witchcraft beliefs and local spirits. But as I show in my own book, this does not go without paradoxes and contradictions. And I'll point, I'll mention a few of these. The first illustration I use is from this um, African the theologian, Father Myra Ebga, a Jesuit priest, um, was a Cameroonian University lecturer, a respected African theologian of inculturation. And he introduced he was introduced to the Catholic charismatic predicament in the USA in the early 1970s and then went on to found in 1976 a charismatic movement in Cameroon called a father and he subsequently became a very prominent Catholic charismatic figure in that region and beyond and he was a highly respected theologian, but also a provoc provocative fellow, uh, uh, which got him into trouble at some point. And he, I'm just, this is just an example. One of his books entitled Emancipation d'Église sous tutelle. Uh, I don't know how you translate that into English, but it could be emancipation of churches under, uh, I don't know, tutelage. Tutelage, yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, advocating, of course, the autonomy of non-Western non churches from Western tutelage. And of course, that cost him teaching position at the Gregorian University in Rome in those days. Um, uh, so he returned to Africa and started this movement called the Father that I study in that in this book of mine. Um, and there you have a picture of Father Edgar actually laying hands of <coughs> on a, 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 a few a few people. And I just want to kind of draw your attention to what I believe was maybe his major contribution to this debate on the issue of demonology. Uh, from his own experience, he proposed experience with the uh, spirits afflicting his patients, he proposed that if we want to a pastoral, I mean this was a pastor from a, both from a theological and a pastoral point of view, if we want uh, a healing, I mean if we want a healing practice which can actually help African Christians at least from his own context, we need to expand the biblical demonology to include not only demons and devils as we are used to from the Bible, but to also include the spirits of the dead, uh, as he called them, the, the, <coughs> les esprits des défunts, uh, the genie, the living witches, and all these are possessing entities that he was confronted with when he was, at, I mean, um, kind of praying over his, what we call patience in a sense. He said, uh, if we only restrict ourselves to the biblical categories, we will not be able to help these people. So we need to expand categories to include this.
And of course, as I show in my book, uh, this has a number of problems because this kind of development has a number of problems because for a number of people, the spirit of the dead are not necessarily, necessarily bad spirits, of course. The danger here, of course, is to demonize local spirits which are not by themselves considered as evil. Now, regarding the relation between charisma and institution, as I've said uh, from the beginning, um, uh, the Catholic Church has managed, and I, that's what I want to dwell on now, has managed to domesticate, in a sense, uh, the, 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 the Pentecostal uh, predicament in its own term, uh, uh, making sure that the charisma does not upset the institution. Uh, I just want to give you uh, two examples of this. One that you know very well because it is... Um, and, and, and before that, well, I put it this way. Why has the charismatic predicament in the Catholic Church not led to the fragmentation of the church as it is the case with many Pentecostal churches moving from renewal to renewal. And as I've said, I think it is because of the institutional control of the charismatic predicament in the Catholic Church. And I draw your attention here to two controversial cases, which a number of you would know. The one of, the first one is Bishop Milingu of Zambia. Uh, and the second one is more, most, I mean, it's more recent, it's in Benin. Uh, both, of, both of these cases led to excommunication from the church. As we know, Bishop Milingu you know, was Archbishop of Lusaka from 1969 to 1983 and appeared on the charismatic scene in 1973. And this is a quote from this book. He says, uh, I knew, and this is again, uh, and this echoes what I've said before about Edgar. Uh, he says, I knew that the Lord was leading me to the healing of the disease of which many of my fellow Zambians are victims. Mashal. This disease cannot be treated in the hospital. During the whole of May, I thought out the different ways by which I could help my sick brothers and sisters. <coughs> so he was trying to respond to a concrete problem faced by people that the Catholic Church was unable so far to handle. Uh, so he had to come up with something. And here was the charismatic offer around. And he was the very first high-ranking Catholic cleric in Africa to be linked with the Catholic charismatic movement. He became involved in public rituals of faith healing and founded, of course, a charismatic group known as Divine Providence Community. And, of course, he had to, fear, to face fierce opposition from most of his fellow clerics, predominantly Irish missionaries, who felt that his healing ministry was not compatible with his duties as an archbishop and was not in conformity with the doctrine of the church. And he was denounced to Rome, he was asked to stop holding his public healing sessions and subsequently removed from office as archbishop in 1983 before being posted in Rome. In Rome, he was allowed to continue his healing practices and rapidly became popular among charismatics in Italy and beyond. But of course, as we know, he got involved with the Unification Church. And this has not really, I must say, served the image of Catholic charismatic renewal in Africa. 
And since 2006, we know that Bishop Milingo is excommunicated from the Catholic Church. I don't know if, I'm not sure it's because of his charismatic beliefs, but maybe more for challenging the rule of priestly celibacy. And so, Milingo's saga shows the tension between charisma and institutional power, which is characteristic of the ongoing domestication of charismatic renewal within classical mainline churches, not only the Catholic Church, of course. <clears throat> now, the second case is a recent, most recent season in Benin from the father, known as Father Matthias Vigan, priest of the Archdiocese of Abome in Benin. Uh, got involved in healing ministries and exorcism since the beginning of 2002 and until his encounter with two of his patients, two ladies, Vicencia and Nicole. And from patients, they became his aides in healing practices. And both came to exert, both of these ladies came to exert strong spiritual influence on him. And then subsequently Vicentia ended up claiming to be God the Father and the incarnation of the Holy Spirit. And these claims were endorsed by Father Matthias and at that point the bishops reacted. She was asked to stop, but refused to obey. Refused also to recount and condemn Vicentia's claim as heretical. And in 2013, both were excommunicated for disobedience and heretical claims. So they went off, both of them, to found a new church called Église Catholique Privée de Baname. Uh, and, of course, Vicentia, claiming to be God the Father and the incarnation of the Holy Spirit, appointed and consecrated him as Pope Christopher XVIII. And the new church in those days attracted, you can see both of them there, the new Pope <coughs> besides God the Holy Spirit. And the new church in its early days attracted huge crowds of people, again seeking solutions to their <coughs> daily problems. That's another, of course, <coughs> shows again that Um, well, um, at the end of the day, the institution has the last word over charisma in the Catholic Church, especially personal charisma. And I would say that it is a fact that the Catholic charismatic renewal has enhanced lay leadership in Catholicism, uh, at least in the context of Africa, that I know best. And uh, this is probably one of the main imports of the phenomenon. But this lay agency, of course, and initiative is under the control of the clergy uh, to make sure that the individual exercise of charisma does not upset the institutional setup. And for that point, from that point of view, if the charismatic renewal has renewed, if it has renewed the Catholic Church, it is probably at the personal level and not at the institutional level. Now, what are, and uh, that would probably be my last main section, 
before we move on to questions and, uh, of course, contributions. What are scholars saying about this? Um, about the attractiveness of the Pentecostal charismatic churches in general uh, and in the context of Africa in particular, <coughs> about the attractiveness of Catholic charismatic renewal in particular. Um, and I will end with a word of conclusion about the future of Catholic Pentecostalism in Africa, the way I see it. First set of reasons given by uh, a number of authors emphasize the, the, the holistic approach to salvation consonant, they say, with the African worldview. And they feel that this holistic approach is missing from mainline churches. And as you have that quote from Alan Anderson, who says that the, the emergence of new Pentecostal churches at the end of the 20th century indicate that there are unresolved questions facing the church in Africa, such as the role of success and prosperity God's economy, enjoying God and his gifts, including healing and material provision, and the holistic dimension of salvation, which is always meaningful in an African context. Um, and Ojo, of course, and Aris also mentioned things like that. Second set of reasons of reasons point to the patriarchal and gerontocratic structures of power in hierarchical mission churches uh, claiming that the new Pentecostal and charismatic churches <coughs> offer a more kind of democratic approach to power structures uh, Mwaura, who is here with us, says that it empowers the young to challenge the authority of the elders who have dominated religious leadership in the mainline <coughs> churches. And still Anderson claimed that, claims that the new churches give opportunity not afforded by patriarchal and gerontocratic religious that have lost their charismatic power or they emerge in reaction to the bureaucratization process in established churches so for the structures of power the way they are handled in the mainline churches on the hand, one hand and Pentecostal and charismatic churches on the other then there's a third set of reasons. Um, <coughs> Magesa, who is here with us, speaks of a number of these movements as communities of afflictions in time of socio-political crisis. And he says that they arise and flourish as responses to real and perceived crises in the social, political, economic, and religious environments of contemporary society and other that has happened to make very many people uncertain, unsettled, and threatened in their lives. And uh, Gifford, who is here with us also, says that <coughs> the worship is participative and exhilarating. Testimonies enable non professionals and the voiceless generally to express themselves and be heard. Where self group exists, they can provide a sense of solidarity. The ills that we said Ghanaians, he was talking from the particular context, the Ghanaian context, are often explained in terms of spiritual forces, and many of these religion leaders, religious leaders, claim the powers to control these forces. So these are seen, I mean, these churches or religious groups are seen as 
spaces where people can kind of nurture their hope. They are holding on to, to survive. Now, what are they saying about Catholic charismatic in particular? Again, I uh, refer back to Myra Edgar, who wrote in 1995, speaking of a tacit connivance between the civilization of the rhythm, of the collective therapy, and of divination with some aspects of charismatic renewal, songs and dances, many streams to the sick, proclamation of inspired messages. And Aris adds that it is my judgment that we, whether consciously or unconsciously, are in touch with a particular part of our African selves when we invite the movement of the spirit to dance, drums, exciting, music and other ecstatic expressions into our lives. So I call it the Africanness argument. But again, some people have argued that the opening the doors to charismatics was also a strategic move from the Catholic Church. Again, Maura says that by strategically opening themselves to charismatic influence, the mainline churches have not only stemmed numerical loss, but have experienced real growth. And uh, Asamoa Yadu adds that historic missions accommodate charismatic renewal groups and phenomena within their ranks because their survival have come to depend on how open they are a Pentecostalist culture, but I say caution because we should not overestimate the influence of the charismatic predicament on the Catholic Church, at least in the context of Africa. The proportion of Catholics actually attracted or influenced by the charismatic renewal within the Catholic Church uh, is still small in terms of attendance and even uh, getting involved uh, with the, the phenomenon. So, uh, in terms of conclusion, I affirm the reality of the influence uh, of, the, of Pentecostalism on Catholicism in Africa. Influence is there. Uh, nobody can deny it. Um, but I also state that the impact of the Catholic charismatic renewal on the Catholic Church is on decline. Uh, I'll say a bit, about, a bit more about that in a minute. Still, the influence of Pentecostalism on the Catholic Church in Africa is an ongoing process and is taking other shapes than just the Catholic charismatic renewal, which is on the decline. Other forms. So, uh, first, yes, the impact is there. Uh, but we shouldn't overstate that impact. Again, as I've mentioned, because it has been more, it has happened more at the personal level and not at the institutional level. Basically, because the, 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 the institution has managed again to tame the charismatic part of it. And from my point of view, the growth of the CCR, which is the Catholic Charismatic Renewal, has stabilized and in most African parishes today, it exists as one group alongside many other groups. But also, the domestication process has tamed the ecumenical dimension of it, which was very strong at the beginning of the movement. 
driven basically for fear of um, kind of uh, I'll call it um, fear of confusion you know, because I think as I've been saying many, the Catholic Church is still very much concerned about not confusing the minds of the Catholics about the difference between Pentecostalism and the Catholic Church, which is understandable, of course. Uh, uh, but how do you do that without <coughs> killing the, the ecumenical spirit or dimension of it? Uh, well, when I say that the, it is declining, I mean, I've, I've done little research in the city of Yaoundé on a, on a number of Catholic charismatic movements, and when I look at the turnover, it is very high. You can see that the number of 24 people, uh, 224 people interviewed there, uh, only more than half, you know, have been in the movement only for the last five years, so, which means that there is a lot of mobility that Catholic charismatic people come and go, maybe because either because they have found what they were looking for, or they have not found what they were looking for, so they go looking for it as well. So that's an indicator that uh, it is a kind of transiting kind of space for many people. Um, and again. I say it is an ongoing process and a major concern for Catholics, still a major concern for Catholics. Um, and the influence of Pentecostalism on the Catholic Church. Um, and I just draw your attention to that book recently, you know, published by, uh, I mean, by these, those two authors, but it was from a research that the, 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 the German bishops, Catholic bishops, you know, uh, as these two, I mean, these two to do on this phenomenon, and it led to this book, which is which basically considers the, I mean, look at it. evangelicals, the Pentecostal Church, and the charismatic as a challenge for the Catholic Church, something we need to deal with, a problem in a sense. But, of course, ecumenism is not only about the hierarchical church. What I want to uh, underline here is that uh, if the Catholic Church is concerned, it's because at the grassroots level, there's a lot of mobility. People uh, move to and fro, you know, Catholic Church of Pentecostals and to and fro freely. And there's no way the hierarchical church can control that movement. Uh, people do that on, almost on a daily basis, I would say. And I've also uh, drawn your attention to the influence on individual, of Pentecostalism on individual charismatic priests and lay Christian healers. It is an ongoing process. Uh, and so, again, the hierarchical church sees it as a challenge, and so, the competitive approach has prevailed over the ecumenical <coughs> approach in their relation, in the relationships between, uh, uh, the relations between uh, Catholicism and Pentecostalism. And, of course, um, to cope with this situation, if we take the strategic argument seriously, uh, as uh, these authors have pointed out, uh, and it is part of my ongoing research now, uh, uh, a number of Catholics have resorted to imitation. <coughs> so you try to copy, or they try to copy from Pentecostals in order to face the anxieties of the faithful. Uh, it is going on. It's an ongoing. 
Um, um, so I call it a coping strategy. Of course, uh, it is, it is um, I mean, closely monitored by the, the, the hierarchy of the church because as we have seen with a few cases, it is very easy to you know, slowly, slowly drift away from what we would call um, orthodoxy or <coughs> normal practice, or orthopraxis. So, again, the ecumenical potential is there, but the reality is that of tensions, conflicts. Uh, Thomas Rao says that the Catholic charismatic renewal forms a potential bridge between Pentecostals and Roman Catholics. Yes. Uh, but of course, tension comes from the fact that much of the remarkable Pentecostal growth has come at the expense of the Catholic Church and other mainline churches. And this Pentecostal growth has led to considerable tension between the two committees. And that is the reality of, on the ground. We can't say that in Africa, Catholics are talking to Pentecostals, at least not at the hierarchical level. Um, so, um, we could say that, yes, Catholics are talking to Pentecostal at the grassroots levels because in families, people have it, I wouldn't say better, but uh, they manage to handle multiple belongings. And so, from that point of view, they are talking to each other. But this has not happened at the hierarchical level. So that's where I end, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Father. <clears throat> Most enlightening. Could I ask, uh, have you changed your perspective somewhat? The way I read your book, you put a considerable emphasis on the American connection. Yes. Here you hinted at it, yes. saying that Father Hebger didn't start his church till after meeting American Charismatics. Yeah. The same is true of Archbishop Malingo. We have no writings of his before he met Americans. Yeah. What's, what's your opinion now about the American link in all this? Tonight you explained it <coughs> almost exclusively in terms of the African realities. What is the American link? Yes, uh, well, uh, it is true that, that I, in my book I show, I mean, I was interested in kind of tracing the trajectory of Father Edgar from the U.S. to, to Cameroon, then come from Cameroon back to Paris, and then from Paris to England, and then back to the U.S. with his movement, because uh, when he started the movement in Cameroon, uh, well, later on, Cameroonian migrants to, uh, to Paris <coughs> established the movement there, and then the same process with the other Cameroonian migrants in the UK and later on back to the US. Um, yes, I was interested in, in that uh, American connection. Um, the American connection is still there, but it's no longer, from my point of view, as far as the Catholic charismatic movement is concerned, it's no longer as strong as it used to be in the beginning because I guess a number of Africans have appropriated the, the movement or the issue now and they are kind of replicating it or even innovating in this area uh, in, such a, in such a way that the, the African agency is stronger now. 
as far as starting new churches uh, um, is concerned. Um, uh, and of course, there are still a number of these uh, charismatic movements which have maintained foreign connections. Uh, and it means a flow of people and resources and uh, but the African agency has grown considerably in such a way that many of these movements are now without foreign connections. Uh, and of course, as they multiply, uh, there are also, uh, of course, issues to address in terms of um, how the state looks at these issues because in the past some of those foreign connections were suspiciously uh, viewed by a number of local politicians because for a number of them they, it could have been a means of foreign influence but these days they are mostly afraid that uh, especially with, it has to do with healing that people could actually be misled by what some call false prophets uh, because you know, a number of these claim number not all of course maybe not even most uh, claim to heal all the diseases because God can heal everything of course have a number of, um, of um, tragedies in terms of health uh, involved in all this. So it has become, I mean, the state is beginning to scrutinize this development of um, charismatic movements, both within mainline churches and outside mainline churches, uh, because of these health issues involved. Uh, but I would say to kind of that the, the foreign connection is still there, but it is no longer strong as it used to be. Thank you. Thank you for editing my book. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Father Lotto. You indicated that you were an anthropologist. Yes. But I, I would like to nevertheless hear your anthropological perspective, particularly on the slide in which you uh, contrasted Biblical demonology yes. and African demonology, yes. in which you indicated there was some problems with some of the efforts to move in that African demonological or demonological dimension mm -hmm. because of the morality or or because potentially of the demonizing, for instance, of the spirits of the dead. Mm -hmm. So, from your anthropological perspective, how would you suggest would be a positive way forward for both Catholic theology and demonology, or for charismatic theology and demonology in general? Well, um, well, that's a difficult question, because um, it's not always easy to, to know whether I'm speaking as a priest, a, an anthropologist, or even some extent, a theologian. Uh, well, uh, when I use the word <coughs> paradoxes in my book, it's basically to highlight these kinds of uh, difficulties, of course. Uh, what I stress regarding this kind of intercultural <coughs> Grafting is that when you look at um, most of African theologians of the generation of Father Edgar, and this were post colonial intellectuals, the first generation of post colonial intellectuals, so they had a very, they were very conscious of the fact that after colonization, Africa needed to reaffirm its identity, its culture, which was kind of 
destroy or in a sense um, um, uh, which was not valued by colonizers and missionaries. So uh, the African movement uh, ideology or movement of negritude for those uh, who know this movement was all about it that uh, I'm, f I'm happy or uh, it was about affirming black identity or African <coughs> culture as a, a, a value as um, and f from that point of view the theology of enculturation which dominated I would say the theological debate in the context of Africa and the, the, in the context of uh, African Catholicism, the theology of enculturation was basically trying to, you know, recover from that kind of cultural, you could say, genocide, as some people have framed it. But again, here was Father Edgar, a strong advocate of enculturation, genuinely trying to make sense of the experiences of his patients but unwillingly demonizing those same cultures he was trying to value. Uh, because when you take, for example, the second category you call le genie, from an anthropological point of view, uh, um, this has been studied by uh, a French anthropologist, uh, uh, and he shows that, from a local perspective, these genies, as they call them, and water spirits, as they call them, for the coastal people of southern Cameroon, these are sources of life. And you, if you want, as a local, to be a successful fisherman, you have to sacrifice to these spirits. They are sources of life. They are not evil spirits. But of course, the rationale between Edgar's approach was that in terms of possession, or from the Catholic perspective, no other entity is allowed to possess a human being apart from the Holy Spirit. That was his rationale. So when he met these spirits, why praying over his patients, he only asked them to move out, as we would do with demons. But again, at the same time, what message was he putting across in terms of his own theology? And that's, what I, that's where I call paradoxes when you come to this kind of intercultural uh, mixture of uh, um, what we could call cosmologies and, and or the like. And I'm not sure I have any easy way out for this. Uh, uh, these are things, I mean, on the ground or in, the, in parishes, priests are st still struggling with it. And uh, again, I think many people saw or have seen the Catholic charismatic renewal or, the, or Pentecostalism as a way out, as a way of addressing some of these issues or local issues which were neglected by missionaries because they believed that they were foolish superstitions and that these things would eventually go away with time. And this has not happened. And building on that kind of anthropological framework, it's really interesting to think about um, telling the story the back way around. So this has been a really nice account of Catholic engagement with Pentecostalism, particularly at this kind of intersection of institutions and charisma, right? So this classically social scientific paradigm. And what's interesting if you tell it about the Pentecostal engagement with sort of mainline Christianity is that in some ways the opposite happens, that you move from, at least in Africa, you take what is kind of vehemently egalitarian form of Christianity in Pentecostalism and immediately start proliferating 
hierarchies in the African context. So all of a sudden you get this proliferation of, of people who are taking the titles of bishop. Sure, I have a friend sure. who jokes that soon we'll meet, we'll meet trishop and quadruship. Sure. <laughs> I think that's a very good joke. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So you, all of a sudden, this sort of internal hierarchization of Pentecostalism sure. happens mm -hmm. that's reflective of and indeed takes the same language that's taken from ecclesiastical hierarchy and Catholic Church. Sure. So it's, it just, it be, it, it's quite interesting to put these things in dialogue from back to front, mm -hmm. and the opposite of the way that you have it, which I think might flesh out even a little bit more, this kind of core tension in your paper. So I wonder if you could speak to that a little bit. Yes, thank you. Thank you for... for um, <coughs> I agree that I have stressed more the the part of I mean the, this aspect of the influence of of the of Pentecostalism on Catholicism, but we could also look at it the other way around: influence of Catholicism on Pentecostal churches and. Uh, I think I will look at it more closely, uh, probably in the final in the final paper. It is true that um, uh, in terms of titles and even the kind of political organization or setup of some of these churches, they they have also borrowed extensively from the Catholic Church from that point of view. Um, and I guess it is a matter of looking at the environment and saying, if we want to be legitimated, how do we handle this? Because um, the use of Roman colors, the use of even the Episcopal or dresses and things like that, you see a number of these. But of course, I can't say, I mean, I'm not sure, uh, I've not looked at it closely, I'm not sure there is a pattern to it. Um, in terms of uh, <coughs> how these, I mean, how Pentecostals actually borrow from Catholics. Um, and I agree with you that maybe it has mainly happened at the level of the, the, the outer um, structure, I mean, the, 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 the clothing in terms of, I mean, and also the the hierarchical organization of these churches. Um, uh, uh, yes, it is very interesting to see to see how, uh, from the egalitarian uh, basis, I mean, they move slowly, slowly towards, and that may be why that may explain why uh, 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 the fragmentation is so uh, high. I mean frequent in those circles because of course if you start with the egalitarian and then suddenly you find yourself under the control of an, I mean institutional control uh, uh, some of the leaders will feel like moving away and starting a new church and of course in the context of the Catholic Church it doesn't work that way if you either you uh, comply or you you go out, or you move out, and, and start your new thing, but you are no longer with the Catholic Church. Um, so yes, I take that in, to say that we could look at this influence both ways. Yeah. Thank you. You've mentioned that the uh, charismatic renewal has, uh, has been effective at the individual, but not the institutional level. Are there some instances where it has been at, effective at the institutional level? and what happened there that was different. And then a second question is... Please, I, I didn't get that question. Are there places where the charismatic renewal is effective in Africa at the institutional level? And if so, what was different there that made it effective? Okay, I, I have a second question. Yes. Um, how effective, how important uh, or supportive do you see Pope Francis being with the charismatic renewal? Um, he's invited all Charismatics to uh, Rome and Pentecost, in Pentecost 2017, and is that any impact on the African Church? Yeah, thank you. Um, yes, I claim that 
most of the impact or renewal has happened mostly at the at the personal level because I think at the beginning a number of people were hopeful that the charismatic dimension will basically shake up the institutional framework of the Catholic Church and make things change. I don't know if it's for better or for worse, but anyway, uh, uh, for a more egalitarian again aspect of it, in which I mean a church in which uh, clerics have less and less power than they have now. So I think a number of people were hoping for this. And of course, when we look at the history of the movement, in the beginning, a number of communities emerged in which lay priests uh, were living together in communities, trying to experiment new kinds of, uh, of, 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 of lives. And, uh, um, but from my kind of field work, or, experience um, that has not really affected the institutional organization of the church as such uh, again the church has opened the doors and said yes you can experiment new things but well uh, it if it helps spiritually that's fine but the church structure is not going to change because of the charismatic predicament. Uh, um, uh, uh, but one thing, I, and that is one of the things I'm working on now in Ivory Coast, is that, and it is kind of a unique phenomenon, I would say, at least in Francophone Africa, uh, that I know best, is that in Abidjan, especially in the Archdiocese of Abidjan, the Catholic charismatic renewal provided a framework for the development of what some have called communauté nouvelle, uh, new communities, which are basically uh, small, we could say religious congregations with a strong charismatic uh, tone in terms of how they pray, how they, and they they have just multiplied in the last 30 years. Um, uh, and the bishop, I know the archbishop is a bit concerned about this because most of these movements are started by lay people. Uh, and are very enthusiastic about cooperating or working with Pentecostals. Uh, they want to invite them and be invited to their many public healing sessions or, but the institutional church is very cautious for obvious reasons that I've mentioned here. Um, but the movement is there and Personally, I want to understand why, in that particular context of Abidjan, uh, I mean, the, 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 that, that mushrooming of movements um, started by lay people, uh, basically small religious congregations. Uh, uh, what explains that? Uh, how, how do we account for that? <coughs> I can't say more about that, but um, uh, it is. It is. That's why I'm, I was saying that it has the Catholic charismatic movement, charismatic movement, provided some space for lay initiative. Uh, but I'm not sure that has really been researched or studied in the sense. Uh, so I want to look at that a bit more closely. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the question about Pope Francis. Yes. Well. Um, honestly, I don't know what to say about that because um, from African perspective, well, Pope Francis, it is true, visited Africa a few months ago, but I must say that Africa, I mean, 
I could be wrong on this, and there are elders in this room from Africa to correct me. Uh, but I think that from an African perspective, at least at the grassroots level, people are still living with memories of John Paul II uh, and to a lesser extent of Pope Benedict. Pope Francis, um, I, I don't see the Pope Francis effect at the grassroots level, I mean, at the popular level. Uh, so, that's what I can Thank you. afford at this point, yes. I think we have time for one more question. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Father Lago. <clears throat> My name is Father Michael, I come from Kenya, and I grew up, um, and um, so the actual battle between charismatics and uh, the other people in the church. And especially in my diocese, um, I saw the bishop time and time again excommunicating people who ascribe to charismatic. And it is only, I think, in the recent days in Kenya that um, uh, bishops have started um, becoming comfortable with this movement. And how I wish there were like five bish Kenyan bishops seated here <laughs> just to listen to this and actually to, to start thinking. Because in my thinking, I'm thinking of like charismatic and this uh, Pentecostalism movement, is re it really speaks to the hearts of Kenyans and maybe I can generalize Africans. It can be taken actually as a point of inculturation in the culture because it speaks about the new pneumatological perspectives of Africans. Mm -hmm. You know, because once I look, I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit, once I look at the, uh, the uh, book of the mass, uh, the Miso, yes. I'm a priest, I pray, I, I, I say mass in Kenya to Kenyans, and some of those prayers they collect, the, the preface, nothing to do with the context of the people there. You, and the prayer doesn't even capture, ask any single Catholic in Kenya what the first prayer was. The collect, and he has no idea because it's just a crafted words put together. But if you ask him what a televangelist said and prayed in Kenya, she has everything like my mother. And so, I'm thinking, uh, my question comes there. And actually, we do not have any liturgical guide to charismatic prayer, which might speak more personally to Kenyans and Africans in that context. And as you said, and someone has asked that, the, the charismatic has not renewed the institutional church, and bishop, many bishops are almost anti-charismatic. Do you think? the institutional Catholic Church is in denial? <laughs> well, um, I tend to think that the, those who uphold the strategic argument half a point. Um, and again, my initial title was has did has I mean has the acceptance of can we describe the accept acceptance of the Pentecostal um, predicament by the Catholic Church as an ecumenical revolution. When I look at that history, I think, I believe that um, something happened there. Uh, a few decades before it was unthinkable that the Catholic Church could even look at Protest, classical Protestants, let alone charismatic as people to speak to uh, with. 
but there was something, I mean, strange thing beginning somewhere else in another church. And the Catholic Church just say, okay, let us look at it closely and see what we can get from it. So, from that perspective, I think we could say that the Catholic charismatic renewal, which from my point of view, comes as a result of the influence of, of Pentecostalism on the Catholic Church, uh, was a baby born out of Vatican II. I mean, that the Vatican II, in a sense, maybe that was the, the first baby of Vatican II in terms of ecumenism. Uh, uh, but I wouldn't say, and from that point of view, it, is, it, is, it was a commendable move that the Catholic Church accepted it. Uh, but as I've shown, slowly, slowly, the institutional aspect of it came to, again, control the charismatic part of it. And that is, I would say, what the Catholic Church is today. It is very institutional. And make sure that it contains all sources or major sources of dissent that could lead to uh, fragmentation. And that's why, I've, as I have shown with a few examples, uh, uh, this process is closely monitored and watched by the hierarchical church to make sure that uh, it doesn't, um, um, you know, upset the Catholic Church, or that the pace of the charisma is contained. Uh, because I guess there is a Catholic theology of charisma, which is not, of course, only about individuals uh, listening to spirits and then reacting to spirits. There is, it has to be, of course, legitimated by the institution. And uh, that's why I feel that, from that point of view, the Catholic Church has accepted the influence, but in Catholic terms. And, it's still a, and I feel that it is still an ecumenical experience. Because I don't think that ecumenism is about just opening the doors to everything. It is about opening the doors, welcoming the stranger, and making the stranger familiar. Uh, and that takes some adjustment. Uh, uh, and that is what has happened, from my point of view, with the Catholic, or the Pentecostal influence of the Catholic Church. Uh, thank you. Thank you.